and welcome to the show. Now, I'm delighted that uh, my guest this week is one of Britain's best loved sporting personalities. Sharon Davis, obviously, is an Olympic swimmer. She has been a champion swimmer for three decades now. Um, she's just written a book, which is this one, Unfair Play, The Battle for Women's Sport. That's it, Unfair Play by Sharon Davis. Uh, good morning, Sharon. <laughs> good morning. It's good to see you. Um, you've become, obviously, as well, pretty well known now as a campaigner for women in sport. And in particular, with the issue that we're facing at the moment, which is the position of trans women in sport. Um, but I wanted to start by saying with this book, um, it's very much in the context, isn't it, of what you see as the general unfairness uh, meted out to women in sport and indeed, well, by the media, isn't that right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really just the battles of women's sport is exactly what it says on the tin, really. And it, it yeah. shows that over the last you know 100 years, it's been really tough for women to get any form of equality. And we still have nowhere near equality, although we are, are getting very slightly better all the time. Um, for example, a thousand women in the UK earn their living from sport. 11,000 men do right. um, in, in America and obviously the UK are pretty similar. Um, American women get 1% of the sponsorship dollar and 4% yeah. of the primetime sports airtime. So it's really tiny. So our, yeah. our piece of the cake is really very, very small. And now we're not, you know, not even being allowed to have fair sports. And mm -hmm. there's not a study in the world that shows that you can remove male puberty advantage. And the reason we have men and women's races is because we're biologically different. Yeah. So to pretend otherwise is just, it's, it's meaning that women at the moment are being told that they're just not worthy of fair sport. And that I think is unfair. So it's not about wanting to stop anyone from doing sport you know I spent my whole life like like you said in the introduction trying to get people involved in sport trying to stop swimming pools from being closed trying to keep people fitter and healthier both mentally and physically but for me this is just about the opportunities that women have fought so very hard to get mm. and now we're losing them you know and we already have this tiny piece of the cake anyway and because I competed during the East German era when for a very different reason, but the same result happened because yeah. young girls were being put through male puberty by the East German you know, democratic um, state at the time. <clears throat> they totally dominated in, in world swimming and world track and field and world rowing for nearly 20 years because of this. And women lost their opportunities for a very long time. And I just did not want to see that happen again. So that's why I spoke out. In fact, uh, you, you mentioned uh, the East Germans there. Um, you, you essentially, you know, lost out, didn't you, because of that? I mean, there was somebody, you should really have got gold, but the uh, in, that was in the 1980 Olympics, am I right? That's right, yeah. yeah. So, so the East Germans were doping their athletes through the 70s and the 80s, and the war came down in 89. Yeah. So what they were doing was taking young girls as young as 11 and putting them through male puberty by giving them steranobol, uh, testosterone, very yeah. nasty, you know, male steroids, which had huge side effects. I mean, many of these young girls have died. Most of them have serious medical conditions. Yeah. Some of them have had disabled children. I mean, it was a, a horrendous era where the IOC for 20 years did absolutely nothing even though it was incredibly obvious what was going on to everybody that was racing. Tell me, Sharon, you, you first spoke out about the, the trans issue. If I remember, it's about 2019, four years ago. Was that in a newspaper? Probably a little earlier than that, because the rule changed in 2015. So the, before that, the IOC had at least in place surgery, yeah. which meant that, you know, a trans identifying male who wanted to identify as a woman uh, had to go through surgery and, and had to be very committed. Whereas in 2015, that was totally removed and even self ID was brought in. So basically, someone could just identify. That was it. So that's just self self identification alone so we've right. had numerous different things and we've had a lot of messing around with with the testosterone levels and there's no evidence anywhere in the world that says that by suppressing testosterone after a male has gone through puberty you can remove the, the puberty advantages yeah, in fact we've yeah. got 18 studies to prove that you can't and the last one was in september of last year came out of brazil one of the largest and that was after 14 years of suppressing testosterone so it's a little bit like boiling an egg you yes. know once you've boiled that egg you can't unboil it. You know, yeah. it, it is. It will benefit from everything that male puberty brings to a male body. And in fact, even really that, you know, males have a different bone structure. For example, Q angle is the angle between your hips and your knees. And that's much bigger in a female for obvious reasons, because we give birth. 
that means that the one statistic that really stands out is female footballers have six times as many knee injuries as really? male footballers because of this increased angle. Yeah. We also have less dense bone structure. So, you know, when someone would, would if a, a male is to kick a female and they kick 50% harder, you're going to have more injuries. Mm. So, and contact sports, you know, it's a serious accident waiting to happen. Mm. When you, I mean, since you've spoken out about it, I mean, there, there's a group of pretty brave women, uh, of, you know, of which you're one. What has the reaction been? I mean, have you, have you had the kind of hideous attacks that other campaigners have had? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, the trans activists are vicious. You know, they want to close down debate. They don't want us to use the science. They don't yeah. want us to be able to talk about this. They want to just stop you in your tracks and stop you from even saying, come on, where's the evidence? You know, and there isn't any. That's the problem. So what they do is they ring your employers. They ring the people you work for. They ring the charities that you work for. I've worked for for decades. They make my life extremely difficult. Mm. But my thinking was that very few people stood up and stopped the era of the East Germans and that was allowed to happen for 20 years yeah. and I could not stand back with all good faith and let it happen again to another yeah. generation of, of yeah. young females and I've had 40 years of you know very good employment of I've had fantastic opportunities all that have come off the back of my sporting success yeah. and I have friends who didn't get that opportunity because three East Germans beat them and so their whole lives would have been different if they'd been able to win the awards that they should have won and I feel very strongly that, you know, that women have had always had a tough battle. We have a tough battle in a lot of areas, but in sport, it's been an extremely tough battle and it's still tough. We still are fighting constantly to try and get parity. And I'm not saying that women footballers, you know, should be paid millions every single week like that male footballers are. However, that there should be uh, an emphasis on trying to grow the women's game, on trying to grow participation. You mm. know, young girls can't be what they don't see. Mm -mm. I mean, do you think that the political response to this by that i mean if you like party political response has been anywhere near adequate i know that sounds like a leading question i i don't think it has but it's fine it's fine well it's back to that thing isn't it you know define what a woman is and as far as i'm concerned a woman is an adult human female yeah and a transgender woman is a transgender woman and that's absolutely fine and we should be yeah. in a place in society where a transgender woman can get respect and safety but I'm not prepared to lie and say that human people, you know, can change their biological sex because they can't. Mm. Yeah. The, the, the DNA that's in your body when you're born is the DNA that will stay with you forever and ever. Mm. And, you know, statistically, um, you know, we know that we have safe spaces because women need it and yeah. that's not changing. Mm. So it's really important that we understand when it comes to sport, when it comes to medicine, when it comes to safeguarding, when it comes to statistics, mm. that those need to be based on truth and reality, mm. not based on a feeling, you know, yeah. and, and I mean, how enough do we marshal a feeling? I, I just, yeah. I, you know, it's impossible. And if we accept that people say, I feel like a different sex, well, where does that stop? Well, do they feel 10 years younger, 10 years older, you know? Do they feel like they come from a different country? I mean, you know, yes. it's it's ridiculous. We have to deal in realities when something is relative to the biology that we actually do have. I wonder, you see, when the kind of, you know, people talk about tipping points, you know, Sharon, where, where some people say, hold on, you know, this is just ridiculous. I mean, you're on Twitter quite a lot, aren't you? We, we had a, there's been a big fight on Twitter recently. There was a woman who appeared in an ITV program as a kind of normal mum. And then there were photographs, she's actually a trans woman, uh, photographs of her apparently breastfeeding a baby. You might have seen these. Um, and you look at it and think, wait a minute, I'm actually being asked to go along with this as though it's sort of truth. But it is, if you like, just simply what she believes, isn't it? Mm, it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, I tend not to, to, to stray too much into all of those arguments. Um, I have my own personal opinions and I do a tremendous amount of homework and research and I talk to people that really know what they're talking about. So yeah. I'm very aware of, of everything yeah. and, and all the science across all the different sort of areas where gender ideology affects. However, sport is my area. You know, sport is what I know. I've been an elite athlete for 50 years. I've been at every single Olympic game since 1976. That's 12 so far. Um, I was an international when I was 11. I was at my first Olympics at 13. I know what it feels like to stand next to people who have been cheating and have, are full of, you know, synthetic testosterone. 
The difference is now it's not synthetic, it's natural. It's the same end result. And I know what that feels like. And it feels incredibly unjust. And to have nobody listen to you when you're saying, all I'm asking for is fair sport, is heartbreaking. Yes. And I have very heartbroken young female athletes, coaches, volunteers, cl- you know, people that run local clubs, teachers on the phone to me um, all the time. Just yeah. paralyzed that, that they're, they're scared to, to use their voices. And what's so very frustrating is that the general public, in the vast majority, believe we should have fair sport. And I just, I just for the love of me at the moment, cannot understand how the silent majority is so silent. How, how big is the problem? I mean, you know, you, obviously you're a swimmer, huge, but- huge. I'm getting bigger every single day. And it's so frustrating when people say this is one or two people. A, it doesn't really matter whether it's one person or a thousand people, because if you're that one person that loses your place on the team, yeah. loses your scholarship to a university, loses your medal, then it doesn't matter. One woman is one woman too many who yeah. should have won that a trophy. However, it's not one, it's hundreds. So there's 50 in, in English football, there's 50 at the moment in North America in cycling. I mean, there are thousands of trans identifying males that are stealing places from female athletes today. Well, I mean, one quite high profile one in your particular sport was Leah Thomas in America. Um, I mean, could you just tell us about that case? I mean, this was someone who was extremely mediocre uh, originally uh, when he was just simply competing as a as a man. Isn't that right? Yeah, so Leah Thomas, Will Thomas, before becoming Leah Thomas, um, had been competing as a, a swimmer for many years. I yeah. uh, was at the at University in America. Um, had never made it through to the NC2As, which is the American College Championships, wasn't good enough, was ranked 465th, I think, in their best event, which was distance freestyle swimming, okay? And then this person transitioned and became a sprinter. So that's like Mo Farrow deciding he wants to win the women's 100 meters. That's how ridiculous it is. And they went from being 465th to being first and beating three American Olympic silver medalists who, as we know, Americans are very strong, you know, in the swimming pool. And that was in the space of a year. Mm. And they were told they had to reduce their testosterone for one year to 10 nanomoles, which is 10 times the amount that I have in my system today. So they were allowed to compete with 10 times the amount that the female yeah. next to them had. And they had spent 23 years of their life totally and utterly as a male. Mm. I mean, it was just ridiculous. And everybody knew it was ridiculous. And it was heartbreaking for those girls that, you know, were told to, to put up with it, even to the point where they had a six foot four, you know, male in the changing rooms with full male genitalia, um, who made it very known to everybody that they still were interested in girls and not in boys. And they were told that if they complained, they would be taken off the swim team. It's so, I mean, it, astounding. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, the thing uh, you alluded to it there, actually, but but two things, really big questions, really. Why do not more women speak up about it? And for, and for that matter, what the hell is behind it, in your view? I mean, what you know? Why has there been so much reluctance to, you see Leah Thomas, you know, on that podium, it, you know, it's like something out of an old Monty Python sketch, you know, I mean, it's so ridiculous. And, and yet somehow or other, it's allowed to pass, you know, uh, why do you think that is? Is it just fear? I don't, a lot of it is fear. A lot of it is fear. The athletes themselves have to sign contracts with their governing bodies. They have to sign contracts with their sponsors. There's a tremendous amount of pressure on them to to be quiet and not to voice their opinions. It took seven years before a governing body asked any of their female athletes how they felt about that. Yeah. Uh, World Rugby were the first governing body to to ban transgender women because on safety grounds, thank goodness. But that hasn't applied across the whole world. There are still lots of rugby. Australia and New Zealand are still allowing transgender women to play rugby against really? biological women. Mm-hmm. All right, and that, seriously, I mean, is just. The, the, the irresponsibility in that is extraordinary. Um, and what's happening is that, that women and parents are then therefore self-excluding their children. So if a, a, you know, a dad turns up with his daughter to play a game of rugby and he sees that there's a male on the opposition, they're literally saying, well, I'm not allowing my daughter to go on and they go home. Absolutely. So what's happening is that girls are losing out because they're self-excluding you know, from, from games, from competitions. Mm-hmm. And one of the worst developments, particularly this summer, um, I mean, it's, I, I can only talk about the UK, obviously, with great depth and knowledge, 
but I get contacted by parents of children that are in primary school and primary schools now are just running co-ed races. So little girls come home from sports day and not a single little girl has won a single competition on sports day. Do you know, this is a... What message are we giving our little girls? That yeah. You're literally telling them you're not worthy and just get used to losing. I mean, it's extraordinary. In a country that has an Equality Act that says that we're supposed to, you know, to yeah. not tolerate sex discrimination. I, I just... My head wants to explode sometimes. I don't understand why we are where we are and why people are so reluctant to speak out. But it's this culture of fear and name calling and you have to get past that. You know, it's um, for me, I suppose I just felt that I was down the rabbit hole so far that I just had to keep going. Yeah. But, you know, it was literally I wouldn't be able to live with my own conscience. But it, it's it's difficult. You know, they, they don't just attack you personally. They attack your family. They attack your friends. They just make your life as difficult as possible. And a lot of people just don't have the courage to really decide that they're, you know, they're, they're able to maybe not pay their mortgage. And I totally understand that. You know, I'm, as I said, in a lucky position, I've had 40 years and I've paid most of my mortgage, not all of it. And we're all struggling with our mortgages, but I've had the benefit of those 40 years. And there are a lot of young people that won't get the same opportunities I got if, if somebody doesn't stand up for them. And we are making, you know, we are making good progress. I mean, World Aquatics now has protected the female category. World Athletics has protected the female category. British Cycling, British Triathlon, British Volleyball. Mm. But there are still organisations like the ECB who mm. all you have to do as a male, if you want to play in the female game, is to go, today I feel like a woman. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. is all you have to do. And, you know, the, the discrimination from very misogynistic sports like cycling and, and cricket has been extraordinary. I mean, the women's cricket team have never even been allowed to play a test on Lords so far. Right. So it's it's the old fashioned, very what I would call traditional misogynistic sports that that are you know very run by by males that have always fought to to keep females out of their sport that probably are doing exactly the same now. Can I just just go back there to something you mentioned already? But I think it is just one of the most important aspects of all of this is the in schools. You know, you mentioned about you know basically mixed race, uh, sorry, mixed sex races and and uh, competitions. Um, what is the situation, Sharon? How widespread is this? On this channel, we, we do cover education a lot and what's happening in education. I mean, is this a question of just like the odd school or it, it just... It, it, I don't it, know exact numbers. I mean, all I can tell you is that I get phone calls at the moment because it's that time of the year, isn't it? You know, where a lot of the schools are running their sports days and I am getting phone calls and emails three or four every week. Really? from different parents across yeah. the country so it's it's a lot more schools and it's happening more and more because heads are scared um you know it, of of protecting females in school in their in the, either whether it's with separate toilets or whether it's with separate races or you know just just acknowledging that biological sex exists at the moment which i think is doing our young children a massive disservice mm. in not explaining them to them the reality of biology and mm. we're going down this horrible route of stereotypes yeah. You know, women have fought for decades to move away from stereotypes. Mm. And then all of a sudden now it's, it's back to, you know, you're actually not a female unless you're trying to look like Kim Kardashian, which yeah. is utter yeah. garbage. And, yeah. and from the world of sports, it has nothing to do with what you look like. You know, you can, you can look however you want to look. What it's to do with is the, is the biology, the physiology of the body that you've got, which is your tool when it comes to competing. Yeah. So it, I find all of that very, very disheartening. You know, we've fought so hard to move away from stereotypes in both directions, you know, with regards to feminine guys or masculine girls. You yeah. know, I think yeah. real, real progress is accepting people for being unique and individual, and it doesn't have to fit into a box. Well, this is, the, you know, you hear about this. This is, this is the problem as well when it comes to, um, transitioning for kids LGBT issue here uh, essentially they look at a kid and they say well you know she's um, what we used to call a tomboy um, which was she me. Might, yeah was me. Um, that means she must be uh, a boy in a girl's body which is the sort of thing that people said as you say back in the 1960s and 70s you know we're going backwards I know, you know? It's awful, isn't it? I mean I was one of those tomboys you know I was up a tree all the time I had short hair I smelled of chlorine I've got twin brothers I was constantly fighting with them you know I did most of my training with lads yeah. um I don't think I wore a skirt you know until I was in my teenage years I mean it, it's it but that had nothing to do with the reality of my mm. biological sex uh, you yeah, know that's yeah. just to do with my personal 
preferences. I prefer to climb a tree than to play with dollies. Okay. Well, what's wrong with that? You know, yeah. and, and it's ridiculous to say that someone who wants to play with a dolly must be a girl. Mm. I mean, it's it's outrageous. It really is. It's just so backwards. It's it's untrue. And of course, what you're doing is you're potentially lining up these children, you know, for a lifetime of medicalization. Um, and if you put young children on cross-sex hormones, many of them will become sterile. Mm. So, you know, you're removing their ability to have a satisfying sex life. And and I think that they will always deep down know, you know, all of it. It's a lie to say that, that you know, we don't know the truth. We may be not, we're pretending we don't know the truth, but I think every single person that's transitioned still knows, you know, where they've transitioned from. Um, and I think that whole thing about not living the truth is very dangerous. Um, Sharon, has anyone, anyone tried to cancel you on this issue? What, what do you mean by cancel though? I've already explained that, you know, these trans activists have called all my employers, have called all the charities yeah. I work for. Yeah. But that is cancellation, isn't it? So yes, yes absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But they're not going to. And the more they do it, the, the stronger it makes my voice, you know? Yeah. So it, I, and sometimes I think they've probably got that message now and, and, and they stopped. And, and I think also the general public are waking up to this. Mm. You know, the more associations that say, yes, the, the science does not support this and we mm. will protect the female classification. But what's frustrating is it's taken nearly eight years mm. to get the governing bodies to even look at the science. You, um, you put in your book a number of different suggestions about what might happen in the future. I mean, when it comes to your sport, for example, or actually any sport, um, what should happen? Um, you, you mentioned uh, the, the possibility of what you might call another category, you know, for swimming. Is that right? Yeah. Well, yeah, so the way that swimming has gone and the way that track and field and most of the governing bodies that are, are ring fencing the female category, because nobody wants to exclude anybody. You know, this yeah. isn't about trying to stop anyone from doing sport. I, it's mm. so important that everyone understands that I would never, ever want people not to feel welcome in the world of sport. However, I'm just after fairness. So if we protect the female classification for people that are biologically female, then we create the open classification, which in many cases already exists, okay? So like, for example, you know, there's lots of golf events called the open. That means that anyone can do it. They don't, they all end up being men that do it and win the big trophies, <laughs> but, yeah. but you know, it is supposedly open, okay? So we create this classification that is open and then everybody is welcome in that classification, however you identify. And of course, what no one ever talks about is transgender men. So mm. these are biological females who wish to identify as male, and when they're taking testosterone, they're not legally allowed to compete in the female category. So where do they go? But because they're females and they're never going to impact on anybody, no one cares. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it's yeah. only transgender women who are biologically male that are fighting to get into the women's category because that's where they will get a benefit. Yeah. Whereas transgender men in lots of instances actually remain in the female category and don't take testosterone. And none of the females that I know have a problem whatsoever. You know, however somebody wishes to identify next to them, providing they're not taking a, a drug to enhance their performance, they have no issue whatsoever. So if women can do that, if women can embrace yeah. transgender men, why can't men embrace transgender women? Do you, what, what kind of political response would you like to see? I mean, do you think there should be some form of regulation or some kind of law that, that makes these things absolutely clear? Yeah, as a final comment, um, I will say that I would very much like to see the government make the Equality Act clearer. Yeah. So when it was written in 2010, they used the word sex. Everybody knew what they meant when they wrote that. However, we've now got to a place where we have to clarify that even more. So I think if we can use the word biological sex, then it returns to us the ability in law to protect sex discrimination. And yeah. I will have no qualms with doing exactly that once that is the case. So that is what I would request. I would request for, you know, for government, who whichever government is in, whichever yeah. politicians are there, that females are worthy. They are worthy of protection. They are worthy of protecting and, and you know, and, and recognizing that we have biological sex and we are different. Not wetter, not worse, just different. <laughs> well, look, Sharon, thank you so much for joining us. Um, the book, the, the book is Unfair Play. Uh, you can get it in all good bookshops and, of course, on Amazon as well. Uh, all the best with it, Sharon. Keep on, keep on keeping on. And uh, all the best. Thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you, thank um, you very much. Have a lovely day. Thank you. That was uh, Sharon Davis there. Uh, thank you. Um, we shall see you next week. Take care. Thanks. Hello. 
If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.